This is going to be an exciting episode. I have taken portions, every Friday I've taken portions of the long discussion that I had with Fred Shoemaker, and I've tried to break them out into different components of golf, of learning golf, of experiencing golf. And this one is completely fascinating. It's pretty short, but it's very, very deep. And um, boy, let's tee it up. Welcome to Data Access Golf, your home for rapid golf improvement. And now, from the thin air of the Rocky Mountains, next on the number one tee, your host, Aaron Stewart. So in this part of the discussion that I have with Fred Shoemaker, um, we've kind of, and I'll just sort of pre-frame this. When, when you go into a school with uh, Fred for the first time, they have a it's a it's a situation where we, you all sit around this table, this conference room that now is such a special place to me because I've, I've spent so much time there with so many different really amazing people discussing the golf swing and discussing life. But you'll, you'll start around this conference table and you'll introduce yourself. You kind of tell everybody how long you've been playing golf and uh, what you what your expectations are for the three days of the school. And uh, it's. It's, uh, it's a situation where the first time I was at Fred's school, Extraordinary Golf, I got super frustrated during this episode because there was a number of people in that room who were introducing themselves that were total beginners. Like they, one guy hadn't even played any golf and he didn't know if he needed to have shoes or golf clubs. They had one lady that played, a, she said she played a couple times you know, that month and that was the first time she's played. And she's actually the focus of what this episode is. She's the one that I actually spent a lot of time with. And um, what had happened then is, is I was a little frustrated. I was there with a friend of mine who kind of started to learn golf from Fred when Fred was just starting out. So they had a good relationship. And I think he, he knew what was coming. And I think he knew that I was a really good um, candidate to be the um, focus of how Fred sets things up because they could sense that I was a little frustrated with the the makeup of the school, the makeup of the students. Uh, Being just a a wide variety of talent levels in the same school seemed um, counterintuitive to me. But anyway, as we got into the school, Fred does a couple really amazing things when you start. And and you don't really get them when you're there. You think that it's a little strange. And I was expecting a little strange. Um, from Thane. Thane Thane had kind of prepared me. I had thought about it. But we went out onto the range and they would video us um, just hitting golf balls, just our normal swing. And then they would have us go to the back of the range and literally they had a big bag of golf clubs. We would throw a golf club towards a target, just literally throw it like you're swinging a golf club and let the club go, skid across the grass and try to hit, you know, a target down the way. And, And this... I think, I can't remember, I think it was a cone that we were throwing at. But anyway, it's, uh, you would throw and they would record it. We, you would then take all those recordings and we'd go back into the conference room and we'd sit up and Fred had, had queued up the, we'd go, you know, grab a drink, do whatever, come up to the conference room and Fred had queued up the videos and he had brought up this lady who had just played a few times that month and it was, she was just starting. He had queued up her golf swing, like when she was hitting balls and he, he hit play. And, um, I, and then turned to me and asked me and said, Hey, um, what do you think of this golf swing? And it it was an awful golf swing. I don't know how else to put it. I mean, it was, it was a terrible, terrible golf swing. And I didn't want to be rude, but I also didn't want to be dishonest. So I said something to the effect of, um, you know, I think Fred asked me, how long do you think it's going to take her to, to have a good golf swing? And I said, yeah, um, I think I said something to the effect. Well, I know I said something to, to the effect of she doesn't have time, meaning her life would end before she became a good golfer, which sounded like a good way to do it at the time. I now hear it and think, uh, what a jerk, you know, I was. But and I, I wasn't trying to be, but I didn't know what else to say. I was definitely on the spot. Anyway, so it's a horrible golf swing. I've now said this. Everybody in the room is feeling uncomfortable. It's a little awkward. Well, Fred wisely steps over to another to another TV and cues up her swing that they had recorded as she was throwing clubs. 
And all of a sudden, there was this lady who was making the most graceful golf movement that I, I, I just didn't think it was possible for her to make a move like this. And she was just throwing a golf club. She was just propelling an object. She wasn't thinking about technique. She wasn't thinking about anything other than taking this golf club in a golf swing type motion and then throwing it at a target and just letting it go. And I was just completely shocked. And then Fred turned to me and said, what do you think of this golf swing? And he called it a golf swing. And all I could say is it's, it's perfect because it literally was. It looked like tour quality, awesome, fluid. I mean, she was in her 60s and she just looked so talented and so fluid and so graceful propelling this club, just throwing it at a cone. And so, so that's where this discussion sort of takes off. And it's Fred's premise. And we've talked about this a lot in Data Access Golf. It's Fred, Fred's premise. And I have proved through my own research and experience that we have within, within us and, and proved through my children and proved through people that are in this mastery program with me that we have with it inside us. And, and Fred's taught thousands of golf schools, but we literally have inside us a very natural and innate ability to propel something. We just know how to do it. And the golf swing is essentially the propelling motion. And so we need to stop trying to control the golf swing with our minds and just allow ourselves to express what we already know how to do through our golf swings. So you'll hear Fred say, talk about, um, Fred's a deep thinker, right? And so I'm always as a simpleton trying to simplify things for my own mind. But you'll hear Fred talk about how learning is experiencing something. And then, and then, um, and then experiencing a possibility, experiencing a possibility, experiencing a possibility is what the throwing motion is throwing a golf club. You can throw a golf club and you can have an experience and feel what that experience is, right? Propelling a golf club. And then you can take a swing at a golf ball and, and experience what that feels like. And then the difference between the two, the awareness between the two, that's where learning happens. And all we're trying to do is take the golf ball, when, when we're presented with a golf ball, and we're trying to not swing and hit something, but we're trying to really get to the motion where we're propelling something. So learning happens when you experience both of those and then compare the two. You're not trying to force yourself to do anything. You're just comparing the two experiences and trying to figure out what's different, what's off. And that's where learning occurs. So this conversation, Fred says it so much more eloquently than I do, but this conversation that we have right now, and it's very short, it's what? It's like two or three minutes short, but it's very deep. I encourage all of you to go back and listen to the portion of Fred speaking you know, two or three times and really kind of put it into this idea that we already have inside of us a perfect golf swing that functions perfectly for us. We don't have to learn really much other than stance and, and, and where to put the ball and maybe some, some, um, some club paths to move the ball in different shapes and different trajectories. But the motion itself as far as weight shift and, and generating speed and power and um, all of that using ground forces, all of that is naturally built in, into us. It's innately us. We just need to discover what parts of that we aren't using in our golf swing and hopefully allow our natural self to overtake our conscious self and express ourselves on the golf course, not thinking. Listen to how he talks about um, Rory McIlroy. We'll finish up to, with a little discussion on Rory McIlroy, especially with him winning the FedEx Cup. Some really good points that Fred makes about Rory McIlroy and, and some statements that he made after the Canadian Open win. So let's jump right in. Here comes Fred Shoemaker and our continued discussion with Fred Shoemaker on everything golf from a, a, a teacher who, a coach, a mentor who has got to have the most brilliant mind in golf. And I'm so excited to get to share a little bit more of Fred Shoemaker with you. So here we go. Instead of going and finding it from this teacher or that teacher, getting my backswing from this and my downswing from that, the, the orientation is now how do I lead something out of me that it is already there? And that's a different way to go about things. And when you go to practice, the whole point of practice is to grow your awareness 
of where you are to grow your awareness of a new possibility and begin to feel the differences in the two. And as far as I can tell, that defines learning. Learning means mm -hmm. I experience where I am. Not that I have a concept, not an understanding, but a direct experience of where I am. The second thing, I have an experience of a possibility that could be way more effective. And then when I swing, I can feel the difference in the two. And if that's happening, the only recourse of a coach is to shut up and watch the learning take place. So that's, that's what the films were about, to have people see that they're quite amazing already. And it, ha it has such a, I mean, the effect on all of us, I think, was extreme. I mean, I, you fortunately um, put us together. I played with this lady, and I wish I could remember her name. I've totally forgotten her name. But we played that. You let us, we go out and play nine holes together at the end of that school, and I, mm. I got to play with her. And she played beautifully. Um, and it was just such a joy to have spent those three days with her, watching her kind of – because she, she went back out to the range with such confidence that she already had what she needed. And, and then to watch her go out on the course and express herself, just be herself and, and play really beautiful. She had some amazing shots. And we had such fun that I, I mean I was that was a that was an important three days in in switching my whole paradigm as far as how golf can be learned. Well in, in, in a great much thing more about, effective way. Yes. Uh, well one of the things about you, you're a person who's open for a paradigm shift. Many people aren't. A lot of people live in the same values and uh, and beliefs that they leave high school with. And then some people say, wait a second, when I see something that shows me there's something actually, uh, let's say, better for me, I can switch. I can change. And that's an amazing thing. I mean, always when I want to take a lesson from anyone uh, in anything, I look for the person who's the best student. Best students always make the best coaches and teachers and mentors and the whole thing like that. And uh, when that lady went out on the golf on the golf course, there was probably a lot less in her head than there are in most players. See, if you if you go on a golf course trying to remember a method to do, you're standing over a shot trying to remember what you did on a range, or what worked, or what the teacher said. That's one way to play. Another way is to go out on a golf course and see if I can just express what I naturally have. So golf becomes a form of self-expression and maybe possible freedom rather than being in your head and trying to think out each move. And it makes a difference. Uh, yeah. And I, it, it, I mean, even, you know, even Rory McIlroy, we just finished the British Open. When he won the Canadian Open, he said, I so love the fact that I could play with freedom coming down the last night holes of a tournament. He said, for me, that was an amazing, validating experience. And you know, as you know, uh, the capacity to have that kind of freedom is less than, than sometimes, more than sometimes. And it's a real challenge to keep that up. I just love the discussion of Rory McIlroy there at the end. And so... How, was that amazing? I mean, it's Fred Shoemaker's amazing. Um, just the discussion of, of I just everybody out there needs to understand there's very two different ways that the golf swing is being taught right now. And I would say 90% of it is this idea that somehow or another we have to learn something, that we have to put something inside of us that isn't there, that we have to muscle memory this and, and, and hit a million balls that. And, and that's just not the case. It, that's completely false. And what we need to do is understand what we're actually doing. And I do think there's a great disconnect there. We've proven it with technology. There is a huge disconnect on what we are actually doing in our golf swings. We think we're doing one thing and we are actually doing something else. And that's the beauty of technology right now is it, it shows us that, uh, that our reality is off. So that can then get you to a point where you are very aware of what you're actually doing. That's a first step. And then you can experience what you should be doing. And that's what's naturally already inside of us. You know, as we, we propel an object, a golf club in this case, 
we can feel what that feels like. We can feel what it loads, what it feels like to load up on your backside, what it feels like to have that weight sort of jump forward on the front foot and have the hips turn and everything come behind it and just whip it out there in total natural progression that's beautiful and graceful and, and works well with your body type. That's what we have opportunity to tap into. That would, that would suggest that we're not going to get injured as much. We're going to be able to generate more power. We're going to be able to stay balanced. We're going to be able to find the center of the club more often if we are just being ourselves. And that's the beauty of it. And how Fred talked about how Rory McIlroy, when he played that last round of the Canadian Open, it was beautiful golf, talked about how he could play free. And so what was, what was Rory McIlroy talking about? Roy McElroy's talking about playing golf without a head full of, you know, swing tips and conscious thought on what to do with his golf swing, right? And, and uh, triggers and trying to somehow or another control every aspect of his golf swing with his mind. Instead, he was able just to let it go and enjoy it, to trust that he has the innate ability to move a golf ball. And I think we saw that as well in, um, you know, in the FedEx Cup championship. It's, it's, and it's very interesting to note how the mind works. Um, the mind, when it feels like it's under pressure, it starts to try to take control. And I think that we saw that quite, um, we, well, I think we saw that for sure in the first round of the, of the British Open when Rory went out there and stunk it up on his home course where he wanted to do well. He wanted to do so well, and he probably felt so much pressure being there in his home country with family and friends and a whole country with their eyes upon you. The conscious mind got into this fear or flight sort of a place and tried to take things over. And Rory tried to think his way around the course where he would have been much better just ignoring it and going. And you, I think you saw that the next day when he almost made the cut, where he went low and almost made it, where he just went out there and trusted himself and let it go. And he played amazing golf. And that's, you see that in a lot of different sports. You hear, you see people talk about being in the zone when they're on the basketball court. And that's literally when you see people get on like a, um, a free throw line, but well, the free throw line is a fascinating place. And I think when we look at the, the free throw line, as opposed to golf, I mean, you're kind of looking at a very similar situation to like putting, right? Where it's a very controlled motion. You don't have a lot of people running at you. You just are there with your thoughts and you can easily start using your mind to try to make your body do stuff. And it doesn't work out very well. And you can see the folks, right? When they get down and it gets tense and you get to the end of the game, they start miss missing free throws because their mind has got to a place where it's trying to control things. Where in the middle of the game and they're just playing and it's flow, they step up, they grab the ball and they throw up a free throw with total natural um, confidence that they can make a free throw. They've made thousands and thousands of them and they throw it up there and they make it. But you see somebody who doesn't understand that get to the end of a game and get put on a line to make a couple free throws and they start feeling a little tight. The conscious mind is now trying to control the way you do something. And as soon as it tries to control the way you do something, it doesn't work out very well. It doesn't work out in basketball. It doesn't work out in golf. Anything that has a complex uh, motion to it where there's a lot of different parts of the body moving all at once to make it happen, the conscious mind just isn't good enough to control it all. And so we're much better off if we don't. Um, so that is just, it was such an important part of the, of the discussion that I had with Fred Shoemaker. And I'm so happy to be able to sort of carve that piece out and put it here and be able to frame it on both sides. It is so important to play golf knowing that everything you need is already inside of you. And all you're trying to do is uncover it. You're not trying to shove something in there. Are there some bad habits that we have to maybe overcome? Perhaps. But those can be completely overcome as we have an experience of what we naturally do and we compare it to a situation or an experience that we're doing in our golf swing and we can compare the two. That's a natural progression of learning where you will begin to be aware of what is different and what feels different. And then you will just naturally start swinging more the way you're built to swing. It just happens. 
It's a beautiful situation. It's a much better way to learn golf. And unfortunately, I think 90 to 95% of the world seems to believe that they can learn golf, force themselves to learn golf. I believe that there's some people out there that are doing it. I believe Matthew Wolf has taught himself a very unorthodox and unnatural golf swing, and he makes it work for him. But that was a very conscious, and you have to take your hat off to the guy for working that hard. But man, it could have been a lot easier. He could have had a beautiful golf swing years and years ago, and he wouldn't have to work on it near as much to keep it where it is now had he learned how he naturally propels something. So, just my thoughts for the day. Again, uh, thanks to Fred Shoemaker for joining me. We've got more pieces to come, and we'll keep putting those out on Fridays. Until next time, this is Aaron Stewart saying, better data always means better golf. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Data Access Golf with Aaron Stewart. Check us out online at dataaccessgolf.com, and we'll see you on the next episode.